Welcome to Staying Connected, a podcast where I talk to other people about their stories with VEDS or Vascular Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Hey everyone, and welcome back to Staying Connected. This is your host, Katie, and before we get into the show, I want to remind you that the views, information, and opinions in these podcasts are those of the individuals involved and do not represent the opinions of the Marfan Foundation. The Marfan Foundation is not responsible for and does not verify for accuracy any of the information contained in them, nor does the information constitute medical or other professional advice or services. This show is not produced by or affiliated with the Marfan Foundation or the VEDS movement. I hope you enjoyed the last episode featuring Heidi Green, who has a nine-year-old daughter with VEDS, Isabella. In this episode today, we're going to talk to Otto Nitschman, who was diagnosed with VEDS at 30 years old. He'll tell you about the rupture that led to his diagnosis, how he's living his life with this condition, and how he and his wife are planning for a family. Thanks so much, Otto, for sharing your story on the podcast. Let's go ahead and go to the interview. Hey, Otto, I'm so excited to have you share your story. Why don't you introduce yourself to everybody? Hi, well, I'm Otto Nitschman. I am 35 years old, just turned 35 on January 1st. Oh, happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. When were you diagnosed with VEDS? When I was 30. It was right after my 30th birthday, actually. Um, It was right after a rupture that I had a few months before and 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 they started digging and and then um it 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 was yeah it took a little bit it wasn't right away it was a lot of people were figuring trying to figure out and and then somebody had a light bulb idea uh my rheumatologist so i saw vascular surgeons cardiologists all sorts of doctors and the rheumatologist was like you're really bendy. Um, we should uh, look into this. <laughs> and, and, and yeah. Wow. So let's let's go through that story a little bit. So what happened with your rupture? So I was on a work trip in California. I, I had flown into San Francisco and then I drove all the way uh, to middle of California, like Tulare area. And I was driving back. Uh, so I had a long way to drive. And I, I had, I, I ate some food that didn't settle well. So I, I, I felt like I, I had to, to throw up. And so I stopped at a gas station. And when I tried to, I, I felt a really, really, really big pain. I, I felt almost like whatever is trying to come out had claws and it just kind of like held onto the inside of my stomach and said i'm staying and 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 that scared me and i said no okay okay i'm not doing this and then i i was just mentioned in the gas station restroom i got up and walked to my car and i started feeling dizzy and i fainted and i woke up again uh got up and fainted again and i couldn't even speak it was really really bizarre I, I knew what was happening. I, I knew that I knew that I wasn't speaking properly. I would say things like blue table mm-hmm. now. And I was trying to say, please call my cousin. <laughs> He's a doctor. He lives not too far from here. And, and it just wasn't making any sense. Um, the, the attendant called 911. And by the time they got there, I was feeling better. But they 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 were having a hard time getting my my blood pressure, and Doug is his name. the The first responder, we're still friends on Facebook. He saved my life pretty much. Oh, that's so sweet. Yeah, yeah. He he was um he was telling me, look, you look fine, but people who are healthy don't just pass out like that in the middle of nowhere. You you're not drunk. You're not high. There's you, you got to go get checked. Yes, mm, I'll do it when I get to Chicago. I gotta catch a flight tomorrow morning. I'm gonna be with my cousin. He was saying, "No, this is serious, man. You you should go get checked. I, I have my work stuff." 
he said, why don't we take your work stuff in the ambulance and, and we get you, we get you some scans and, and if everything's fine, you'll get to go home. Okay, I'll go. And, and as soon as we got to the small hospital, um, they found internal bleeding. And, and they're like, we, we got to open you up and see where this is coming from. And they couldn't even do that in that hospital. They had to transfer me another hour long ambulance ride. By the time we were there, I was bleeding so much from the inside that my, my belly was ballooned up like, like a pregnant lady. It was, and it was so painful. I, I have never been so rude to people in my life. I was screaming at people. Ah, and they, they couldn't give me painkillers because otherwise they can't find what's wrong. And and they, they had to hold me down to get into a, a scanner. I, it was it was intense. And long story short, three surgeries later, I had a ruptured aneurysm on my splenic artery. So they had to remove my spleen. And then they also found other aneurysms in my intestine. So that, that was like the trend. And my father passed away when I was four of a brain aneurysm. So that's where they started connecting the dots. And I'm like, well, there's, there's something kind of weird going on here. And, and that incident, I, I ended up spending three weeks in the hospital. I couldn't eat. Uh, at all because my intestine I, I don't know if you're familiar with how that works but when they kind of disconnect your intestine or your GI um, it kind of turns off and then they connect everything back up and sometimes it takes a while for everything to start running and and that took a really long time for me so that was that was very hard mm -hmm. um, anyhow that that's how we found the the trend right there's a lot of aneurysms and your father had this. So then, as I mentioned, the rheumatologist said, let's, let's run some, some genetic testing, which I think at, at first it was hard to get the insurance to approve. I don't, I don't know how that works. And I don't know if somebody, cause I, I had a lot of doctors that, that were very not, not interested, like curious, but they were, they cared about me. And, and they were doing a lot of things. And I don't know if they did something that ended up just because because when we finally got approved, I had an appointment with the geneticist and she just gave me some paperwork for the test. And she said, just take it, just take it, just go and do the test. And it seemed a little off, but she was very nice and 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 and, and she helped me with that. Oh, that's so great that you had somebody to like advocate for that testing for you. Yes. Did that seem odd to you? Like you're 30 years old and I'm guessing you didn't know you had these aneurysms in your abdomen. That's correct. So how did all of us feel going through this? It, it was, it, it was such a shock to my life. Right. But it, it, I think the biggest thing was, being in the hospital and all of that. And, and then, because this happened months later, by the time I, I was very, very weak. So when, when you stop eating first, your body consumes all your fat and then all of your muscle. So I, I was a bag of bones and, and I could barely stand up. I didn't have enough energy to move around the house. And, and by the time that I got the diagnosis, I was already in much, much better shape. So I felt that I was already kind of out of the woods. So it was very weird. Then all of a sudden, I, I, I thought I was just going to live with, I don't know, I, I don't have a spleen anymore. That's all that I'm going to have to be dealing with. But then realizing that, okay, no, this is a much more serious condition that can land me in that spot in in without any notice so that's that that was very um th that was intense that was very hard to adapt to and um yeah i i obviously didn't like the feeling of of being so weak and i think we've talked about this before but how people treat you <laughs> how 
Yes, I, I was. I mean, you can tell I got a little more meat on me now, but I was very, very, very skinny and people. I mean, I was I was fragile uh, and 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 I didn't like that feeling, that reaction that I was getting from people. Yeah. The way they, they touch you, like they're careful. They don't want to break you. And and, and I, I, I didn't like that. So I kind of always try to tell myself, I don't know. It's, it's a weird thing. Yes, I'm, obviously I'm still dealing with it, yeah. um, but I'm a lot better at it now. What strategies do you use now to kind of cope with that? Um, uh, the, I think the hardest thing is the loss of control. You don't know when it's going to happen. So as, as hard as it is getting checked, because whenever you get a, a, a CT scan or whatever the test they got to run, it's, it's really stressful trying to waiting for, okay, what did they find? Knowing that there is something and you're monitoring, monitoring it or knowing that there is no new stuff is uh it's a good way of of regaining control mm-hmm. seeing your doctor staying up to date with the latest in medicine taking your pills regulating your pressure which that's that's such a interesting thing right because you can also do a lot of things like stay away from certain exercises stay do, do some things and I had a really hard time with that because I, a lot of the things that I like to do and now I'm not supposed to like rock climbing and, and I, you also get very different, uh, different answers from different doctors. Uh, I've literally had doctors tell me, yeah, you're okay to go climb. And some that say, no, you probably shouldn't climb. So it's, it's hard to even stick to something. And there, I'm sure, I don't know if you've seen that chart. There's, there's a chart that shows uh, different sports. There, it's it's a X and Y axis. And, and sure enough, when I stopped climbing, I started cycling. And the first thing that I saw is that that chart has cycling on the top of both axes. So I'm like, what, what am I supposed to do now? <laughs> right? Everything I like, it's, it's terrible for me. <laughs> yeah, I think that's an important, like, bit of perspective too you know like because you weren't diagnosed until you were 30 like you Mm -hmm. were diagnosed at 30 so you know you had a whole 30 years of being active doing those activities that you have to do and then all of a sudden being told like okay maybe maybe you should do that Mm -hmm. you know that's a it's a hard thing to adjust to and then you introduce like uncertainty into it you know some doctors saying yes yeah. that's okay to do and some other ones saying no you probably shouldn't and then seeing some of these things on a chart like it can be so confusing yes completely and yeah. and then you always find ways to blame yourself um last year i had um i was having a little bit of stomach ache and then it lasted for like a week, two weeks and then i said oh, okay let's go get checked and as it turns out, I, I had a dissection that was um, cutting a little bit of blood flow to my stomach, and that's what was causing the pain, which was pretty easily fixed with um, some more blood pressure medicine. But then I was like, oh, man, I, I went climbing two times earlier this year. Maybe I caused it. And, and so it's, it's hard. It's, it's psychologically hard. Yeah, I think that's a it, it is very psychologically hard living with this condition. Just the yeah. the spontaneity of it and you know when I when my spleen ruptured in October, I spent a lot of time thinking like thinking back over what I did that morning. Like could anything mm-hmm. have realistically caused my spleen to rupture? Yeah. And I kept landing on like no, it's spontaneous. No. There's nothing that I actually did. But I spent so much time actually like thinking about that and trying to find something that I did to cause it, because I think, you know, like it's part of that control that you mentioned, you know, like not having control over it anymore is a challenging thing. So Mm -hmm. in some ways I was trying to control, you know, find a way that I controlled it, you know, like if I had realized that, you know, doing X caused my spleen to rupture, then I could have prevented my spleen rupturing. Yeah. 
And I, I almost like to, the way I justify that is it's not individual events. Um, who knows? Maybe, maybe if I wouldn't have done those two or whatever, three days of climbing, it wouldn't have happened right away, but it maybe just, it would have accumulated and happened later. Right. Maybe I, which is still, it's, it's such a weird thing to wrap your mind around it, but it's, I, I think the best thing to understand is that you can't, you can't prevent it. It's, it's, right. and, or you can't, like you say, you can't point at something. Yeah. There's not always something to point at. Mm-hmm. I think like sometimes there is a really clear, like cause and effect. And, and then sometimes there isn't and letting go of that daring, like when there actually isn't something <laughs> like hard to let go. Mm-hmm. So the, the first time it happened, I can, I know it was because of the effort I, I did when I, when I was about to vomit, right. It, it was, it's, it's that effort. And, and that's, I, I felt it. Yeah. Um, but I've, I've gotten sick since then and it didn't happen again, but now I get, I get super scared every time I get the stomach. So, so I, I don't know. It's, it's so weird. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is so weird. So when you were, when you were younger, like I'm guessing they, with your dad's brain aneurysm, that they, they think that he had beds. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they, they think that, but I don't know if, if, I mean, at, at the time we were living in Mexico, I, I grew up in Mexico. I was, I was, I was born in Texas and then grew up in, in Chihuahua city. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know if the, just that the medicine wasn't as advanced. I, this was in 1991. I, I don't know even if that was in anybody's radar back then, regardless of where you lived. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but nobody ever thought about it. It, it was just kind of, oh yeah, this happened and he didn't never had any before. And he wasn't a smoker, barely even drank. I, I, I don't know. They did. Those things just happen sometimes in a vacuum. Um, so they didn't investigate it. So did you have any signs like when you were a kid that you had this that were missed? Uh, I mean, Never, never any vascular. I mean, I bruise really, right? But that's just, you're pale. That's what happens when you're pale, right? That's what I attribute it to. I, I never realized that, for example, my, my skin was much uh, weaker or fra- fragile than other people's. I, now I realize as I was telling you, with all the climbing that I used to do, I would always bump into rocks and and get little cuts from that. And and I never, I just thought I was a super hardcore climber because I was always bleeding, you know. But but as it <laughs> turns out now, it's just that when I bump into something, I get hurt easier, and other people don't. And 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 now I'm kind of jealous of that. <laughs> it's I, it's funny because my wife will bump into stuff and I'm like, nothing happened to you. <laughs> Ow. It's like mind blowing. It's mind blowing. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it is like, it's surprising because mm-hmm. same for me when I was younger, I would get cuts and scratches and stitches and, and yeah, everything just, all over the place. And I just thought I was rough on my body, but yeah, it was mind blowing. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now, so you are married. How long have you been married? Yes. Uh, coming up on four years. Congratulations. Thank you. March. March. Oh, so around the time that this podcast goes live. Oh, right on. It'll be, that's awesome. So are you planning a family or how, how are you approaching yes. that decision? So this is, oof, this is a, we can make a whole podcast on that. <laughs> um, so yes, we, we had um, genetic counseling and in particular genetic family planning counseling. Um, and, uh, by learning, uh, or going into these counseling sessions, we learn that we do have an option to, to not pass along this condition to our kids. And this would be through IVF. 
um, because you can do genetic testing on the embryos and, and long story short, you can, you, your kids don't have to have it. And we said, yes, yes, we want that. Um, I, I, I don't wish this on anybody and I, I don't want my kids to have it. And if I can, if I can prevent that, then yes, let's do that. Uh, it's tough. Well, first of all, it's, it's, it's tough emotionally. It's tough. Um, and, and it's mostly, mostly on, on the female, right? Because, uh, my wife, uh, she has to get a bunch of hormone shots and, and, and it's, it's tough on her body. It's, it's, yeah, it, it's really tough. Then financially, there's not a lot of insurance, uh, plans cover this. And we found that out the hard time, the hard way. We both have insurance through our jobs. Neither my job or her job offers it. And, and so it's, as I mentioned, it's, it's tough emotionally. It's, it's physically painful. It's, it's, it's financially stressful. It's these things are super expensive. All these like hormone shots, they're like 400 bucks a pop. And you got to take like 30 a day for two weeks. It's, it's crazy. So like we, we, we learned by trial and error. We, we tried one cycle out here in Chicago and that wasn't successful. And then my, my wife is from Colombia in Bogota. So we, we heard of a, of a really good doctor out there that was doing the procedures. He's got a bunch of awards and stuff. So we said, yeah, let's give it a try. And it was like three times cheaper. So we, we went down there and, and we tried a bunch of times and it didn't work. Um, yeah, we're, 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 we're experts sadly at this now. We've done like six extractions and three implantations. And, and, and then every time it doesn't work is it's very, very emotionally taxing. And, and sometimes it's, it's, it's the curse of knowing a lot of the times when people try to get pregnant and they don't get pregnant, they're just like, Oh, it just, it didn't take this time. But a lot of the times it does take, uh, you're just not monitoring as close and Sometimes there's just a genetic abnormality, which is very common. And it just, you, you don't even know that you are pregnant at all. But when you're monitoring it this close, you do know, and you're, you see everything and every step. And it's, it's a lot more disappointing because you get your hopes up all the time. And so, so yes, as I mentioned, we tried it here, didn't work. We tried it in Colombia. It didn't work. And then we were going to do another cycle when the pandemic started and then they closed the borders. So then we took out a loan to try to do it again here. Because when I say this costs a lot, it's like 25 grand a try. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. And, and it depends on how far along you get on the, on the, on, on the process. And then they opened the borders and then, oh, okay, we're, we're able to go back there. And again, we got bad results, um, about bad, bad outcome. Sorry. Then we said, you know what, let's, I think we, we had better results when we were in the U S let's try it again there. And when we went again, the finance lady was telling us, well, why don't you just get an Obamacare plan? We, we were what? But you can get that. Well, how, I, I mean, we already have insurance. No, no, it's really cool. Go into this website and you can literally pick the clinic or the doctor in specific that you want. And it gives you back all of these uh, insurance policies that will cover that. Hmm. So <laughs> that's a game. That was a game changer. That's we're like, yes, we're going to do that. Yes, of course. And that actually worked. At the the yeah the the insurance yes we we got an extra insurance which is more expensive than normal insurance because you already have insurance from your from from our employers but it's I mean if if you do the math it's it's something like four hundred bucks a month 
plus the maximum out of pocket. This, I, I think it turned out to be like seven or eight grand a year, but you get four, four attempts. So, oh, wow. so you're getting like a hundred thousand dollars worth of treatment for the seven, right? So, so it financially, it makes way more sense to do that. And I had no idea that this was a thing, that that was, it's one of those things that nobody really knows how to navigate the medical system here. And that's important. So like you're, so anybody who's listening to this, who is also trying to go through the same process, like by sharing all of this, you're helping them learn to navigate it. Yeah. Well, hopefully. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whether it's because of a genetic condition or, or infertility, mm -hmm. it's, it, it helps. Did you have any concerns or qualms about becoming a parent? Oh yeah, because... totally. Everybody. I mean, it's scary. It's scary, but. How did you get through that? Like walk us <sighs> through your. Through I don't know. I, I don't think you get through that. <laughs> I think being a parent is scary regardless. And I'm not even a parent. I mean, it's just from what I've heard from people. I mean, it's, it's, it's something that I, I want. We both want, that's what we want the most. And it's scary. Yeah. I, I, I know this is terrible, but people will get it. It's it's like when we were gonna get a dog. It was scary. We we even it was stressful actually. Right before the dog, we read a bunch of books and and we were preparing the house and 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 we were even it was stressful. We were fighting a lot before that. But as soon as the dog was here and it was like go time, it the fighting stopped. Then, then it was more of oh, okay. Let's just coordinate. Let's figure out how we're going to do this. How are we going to do that? I mean, because I, I, whether you want it or not, it's sacrifices that you have to do. Whether it's your time or you have to put money or stuff. It's 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 a it's a team thing. And I feel that um, probably having a baby is going to be like twenty times that. Right? Obviously, it's way more intense, but I, I think it's very similar. It's something that we both know we want mm -hmm. and it's scary. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know how to do it. Um, but we both want it and, and, and we're doing everything we can for that. That's great. I really hope that the next round sticks. And me too. Me too. It's, <laughs> uh, it's another terrible thing I'm going to say. <laughs> Uh, you know how in medieval times they, they say that women wouldn't even get attached to their kids until they turned two because infant mortality was so high. Mm -hmm. I've, I, I try not to get my hopes up, but, but it's, but you do, but you do. And then it doesn't work. And then you're sad and it's, it's painful. It's yeah. painful. It's sadly one of those things that don't, it doesn't. It, it doesn't stop being as painful. <laughs> it's, it's. You don't get it, used to it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That has to be hard. And to your point about like knowing like when it happens mm -hmm. that it didn't take, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's so when, when, um, during a normal pregnancy, um, yeah, I mean, women don't normally find out until they're like eight, ten weeks in, I, I, and, and it's a lot later. Mm -hmm. Whereas here, you you you're you're aware at like five or four, and 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 you're getting monitored. Uh, you're, you're you're she's getting um, ultrasounds all the time, and 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 then that moment when they tell you. And there's no heartbeat. It's it's terrible. It's terrible. You just you want the earth to swallow you. It's 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 terrible. Yeah. yeah. I really really hope it works. Yeah. As yeah. soon so that y'all can start planning a family. Yeah. It's wonderful. Yeah. Hopefully. Um. So we talked about your splenic artery rupture, and we talked about IVF. Um. How do you? how do you handle your diagnosis like day in and, and day out? Have you noticed like 
major strategies or if there's somebody else listening that maybe is just diagnosed and trying to figure out how to navigate this, like maybe they were just diagnosed at 30 and their whole yeah. life has changed. What would you tell people? It's tough. Yes. They, your whole life does get changed upside down, flipped upside down. It's, um, counseling. Counseling is really good. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, trying to get control of what you can, staying on top of your doctor's visits, not just because it's going to make you good, <laughs> make you not, not get sick, but it, it psychologically makes you feel like you're in control. Mm -hmm. it, it helps with me. Um, this is a tough subject. We've talked about this. Uh, you, you, your life expectancy is low. It's, 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 it's a hard truth, but, and you're thinking about it all the time. And, and every time you have the smallest little pain, you think you're going to die. It's, it's, it, you, it's, it's a legitimate concern and it's, and it's very stressful. It's very, um, yeah, but, but you get, you get used to it and that you do get used to. And I, I struggle a lot with planning for the future. The immediate future is easy, but the long-term future, it's hard because you don't have the same outcome. You're, you're like, well, what if I don't make it to retirement? Well, why, why, why am I even saving? Right. But you're, you obviously save in case you make it. And that's the same for everybody because anybody can get hit by a bus. They're just a lot more buses in my life. Um, I love the transformation of that analogy. <laughs> I like, I really love the transformation of that analogy because so often I'm like, I really like when I was first diagnosed, so many people told me like, Oh, you could always get hit by a bus. And I'm like, you're missing the point. You know, yeah. like you're totally missing the point. Like, yes. yes, I could get hit by a bus, but I I can avoid getting hit by a bus by not crossing the street in front of a bus. Yeah. Like <laughs> <laughs> These are invisible buses that drive at 120 miles an hour. <laughs> They're just like sudden, unexpected. Yes. Yeah. I love the transformation of that analogy <laughs> that there are more buses in your life. Yeah. 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 And and if you just gotta enjoy it even more. But at the same time, you're you're thinking, right? A, a competing thought is, well, I'm not gonna let it rule my life and I'm going to live whatever life I want to. If I want to live a, a normal life, I'm going to live it. So I, I heard somebody say uh, one time, I, I would much rather die in a motorcycle accident than just trying to be cautious at a house by a rupture. Right. And that makes sense. Yeah. I think everybody handles it differently too. Like some people will, yeah. will prefer to, to live their lives like that and not think about it. So yeah, it's an important perspective that everybody handles it differently. Yes, and 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 it's not one or the other. You can find somewhere in the middle, and and sadly, that's when <laughs> you start thinking, "Oh my God, did I get that rupture because I went climbing?" <laughs> yeah, no, that's great though. So you do still climb? <sighs> yes, but not as often, and I try to keep it very, um, very light. Um, one doctor recently, I, I, I was doing the Spanish summit that you invited me to. Um, and one doctor said, I tell my, uh, my patients to stay away from sports when you're, where, where you're clenching your teeth. Hmm. So, so, okay. I can do lighter climbs when I'm doing that. But I, I sometimes I go climb. I I I haven't kicked it out of my life, but but because I like it. it, it makes me makes me happy. And that's important to have happiness in your life. Yeah, but I I don't do it all the time. Like I I haven't done it this year, but I I, I try to do things that'll that'll keep me happy. Yeah. So I know a lot of medical professionals listen to this podcast. Do you have any advice for them on what you would want them to know 
from somebody living with VEDS? I guess that that balancing act of of what is good for your physical health and what is good for your mental health. Um, trying to understand the patient as a whole. So don't if if you're a vascular surgeon or a cardiologist, don't focus only on that, only on that, but try to see the, the person as a whole. I, I think that that helps. That's great advice. Hopefully somebody's listening. <laughs> I hope that they are. Uh, and and I, I've had great doctors. I've had great doctors. But, I, and this is maybe just me complaining, but I, I hate it when they tell me I can't do stuff I like. <laughs> and as you know, we're already going through enough. And and maybe maybe look at it from okay, let's let's investigate what are alternatives that we can do. I, I had the uh, one doctor who's really good. We were talking about blood pressure and how to monitor it. So it's you you can't continuously monitor your blood pressure, right? Um, but you can monitor your uh, your heart rate. And what you can do is try to find the correlation of your heart rate versus your blood pressure. And you can have like a smartwatch that will give you an alarm or alert you if you go over a certain limit. So there's things you can do. One of the doctors suggested, I, I check my blood pressure, find this correlation, while I'm cycling, mm-hmm. because as I mentioned, cycling is is one of the ones that is way up here on both axes of that diagram. Um, so it's it's a good way of kind of regulating how much effort you're putting into it and keeping your blood pressure low. So something like that was very helpful. Yeah, and that's like so that doctor really put in the effort to not say, okay, no, don't cycle. Instead, they said, let's figure out what your blood pressure is like when you're cycling. Exactly. Because he already told me not to go climbing. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing your story on the podcast, Otto. I really appreciate it. Very welcome. It's, it's hard, but it's, it's you, you just, you got to find the good stuff and, and, and learn strategies of how to how to cope with it from from others. So I am happy to to help and answer any questions that anybody may have. Wonderful. I'll uh, put maybe I'll get some contact information for you or something. Yeah. Put it in the episode description. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you so much again, Otto, for sharing your story. You're welcome. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining us today. And a big thanks again to Otto for sharing his story on the podcast. If you find this show helpful or informative, or you really want to help us raise awareness of VEDS, I hope you will consider sharing it with your friends on social media. You can also support this show by joining my Patreon at patreon.com slash translucent1. Don't forget to subscribe to this show wherever you listen to podcasts and stay tuned for the next episode on April 30th. We will be talking to Grace Airbar. Thanks so much, and I will see you soon.